don't you have a seat and let's pray together. Oh Lord Jesus, we, uh, we're thankful today, this uh, Memorial Day weekend, Lord Jesus, uh, we remember those who have given their lives so that we could sit here um, to have the freedom to worship you out loud. We're, we're thankful, Lord, and it draws our minds and hearts to words that you said, greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friend. And Lord, you have done that for us. God, we remember um, your beautiful work your sacrifice. Lord, we sing those words and we're here this morning because even if it's just a tiny part of us, we believe it. We have to believe it, Lord. We have to believe there's a way. We have to believe that you're the one that can get us from this life to eternity. Lord, we try things on our own and we run into dead ends and Lord it brings us to our knees sometimes to a place where we are saying Lord even if I can't see it I have to believe you're working Lord your scripture tells us that's true God when we sleep you're working while we were dead you were working while we were unlovable you loved us to the very end an everlasting love and so God this morning as we open your word again uh, would you speak to us would you give us insight and discernment from your spirit Lord not just our intellect go past our intellect go deep go to the core of who we are sneak into the back door of our souls Lord where maybe our intellect has tried to keep you out and get us, Lord. And we, Lord, ask that just wherever we are spiritually this morning, you would meet us. And we ask this in your beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in the book of Revelation, and I uh, hope you guys are already have great plans for this weekend. Obviously, this is one of those weekends where a lot of people travel and there's all kinds of fun stuff going on. So we're thankful. We're thankful for the, the time off. Uh, big season of transition. We've got graduations happening. We have people um, moving sometimes. So sometimes we have people moving. We say goodbye. We have people getting ready for the next thing in life. And it's exciting. And so we want to hear God's voice. We want to have him speak to us uh, this morning, we're in Revelation chapter 3, and uh, I just had to, I just had to, <laughs> because I love food. Um, and it's what I thought about as soon as I read with the church in Philadelphia, I was like, mm, Philly cheese. But it actually fits, and I'll, I'll tell you how it fits. Uh, I used to go visit Grandmommy Ellenberg, my, my, my dad's mom, and it was one of those things where when I would go to Grandmommy's house, First thing we did was go to the grocery store and buy sugar cereal. And I never got sugar cereal. And I was like, what? She's like, what do you want? And I was like, cookie crisp. <laughs> like the very worst one you can get. Like, let's just have the name be cookies in the cereal. But it, she was like, yep. And man, she put me on her couch with my little short legs. They didn't get really much longer, but they're still short. Um, but sitting on the couch, hanging over the edge with her homemade afghan that I would put my toes through the holes. Um, not supposed to. She'd always say, don't put your, holes, your toes through. I was like, but that's what you do with, with this crochet kind of thing. Uh, and she'd bring me a tray with cookie crisp and banana cut up into it. So that was one of the things she did. But she would also take me to the food court at the mall. And as a little kid, I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. And it was like, look at all these places we get to pick. You can pick any one you want. And so I would walk by, I'm just a little guy, and I'm like walking and looking at everything. You know, they give you a little sample here and there. And they got to this one place, and there's the glass, and there's the guy back there, and he's like, da -da 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 just the sizzle is coming off the grill. And I'm like putting my little nose over, and he is making Philly cheese. 
And it was the first time, so I haven't even had it in Philadelphia. I've only had it in other places. But as a kid, I have this memory of getting this amazing sandwich and sitting with my grandmother and being like, this is where I want to be. This is where I want to be. And what's great about this passage this morning is Jesus comes in and, you know, he's kind of had some tough things to say to these other churches. He comes into Philadelphia and he's like, all I got is encouragement. I just want to sit here. And I, I imagine Jesus walking in going, what is that wonderful smell of steak and grilled onions and peppers and cheese? Can I have that with fries? Yes, you can, Jesus. Sit down at the table with the church in Philadelphia and let's see the kind of church that Jesus says, you know what? I want to I wanna sit with these folks. I want to sit down with them. I want to encourage them for what I see in their life. And I hope you can find that today. I want to say this, though, before I jump in, and I'm totally stealing this from another scholar, theologian, N.T. Wright. 80% of what I'm about to say today will be correct. I just don't know which 80%. I love that. He says that a lot of times. I've heard him say it a few times. And, but that's true. I'm a human being. I am going to give you, I've studied, I've looked into this, but I am not infallible. There will be things that I may say that you may be like, hmm, which is why we pursue the Lord together. And we've said this about Pleasant Valley. If you may be like, it's just the greatest place ever. And you, we just say, if we haven't disappointed you yet, just give us time. We'll do it. it. We're not perfect, but we come to the one who is. And so we open God's word. We've already mentioned with Revelation, there's lots of different ways to interpret it. And so we invite you on your own. So we handed out those little books, study, dig in, dive in. You know, we've got the podcast we're doing. We mentioned a lot of resources that we're looking at. But let's listen this morning for the Lord to highlight something for you. Something where you'll say, that is for me. So Revelation chapter 3, the church with the Philly cheesesteak, verse 7, here we go. Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, thus says the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, who closes and no one opens. I know your works. This has become a theme with all of the things Jesus has said. I know you. I've placed before you this is the only command in this whole chapter. Look, just look. I've placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have just a little bit of strength left is another interpretation. You have but little power, yet you've kept my word, have not denied my name. You've kept my word and have not denied my name. So Philadelphia does not have a correction from Jesus. He doesn't say, but I have this against you. He just jumps right in and says, listen, here is what I see. I want you to look. So the first thing, the holy one, the true one, the true one. Jesus is the true one. We, all, we usually know this whole thing about God is holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. But he's true, he doesn't just say true things. He is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Another way to say that is he's trustworthy. Just ask yourself this morning, do I believe that? Do I believe that Jesus is trustworthy? Not in just what he says, but who he is. Do I believe with Dallas Willard that Jesus is the smartest person who ever lived? Do I believe that? I love, I'm just going to quote a couple of things from him. I, I'm reading... I feel like so many people ask me, what are you reading these days? And I'm like, like 20 books that I haven't finished. Because <laughs> it's what mood are you in? And I'm like, oh, I'll read a chapter from this one. And then I like, I mean, I love Kindle for that reason. It's like I'm carrying around everything. It's like, what do I feel like reading? And so Dallas Willard is one I've been working through. It's kind of the second time through too, but it's the divine conspiracy. And he says this, can we seriously imagine that Jesus could be Lord if he were not smart? Could he be Lord if he weren't smart? If he were divine, would he be dumb? Would he be uninformed? He must be the best informed and most intelligent person, the smartest person who ever lived. 
So think about that when it comes to your life and the stuff that you're thinking about. And as you hear Jesus stepping forward and saying, hey, I am the true one. At the literally mundane level, Jesus knew how to transform the molecular structure of water to make it wine. Mundane, nothing to him. He knew how to take a few pieces of bread and some fish and feed thousands of people. He could create matter just from his ability to draw from the energy that he created in the heavens right where he was. He knew how to transform the tissues of the human body from sickness to health, from death to life. He knew how to suspend gravity. He walked on water, interrupted weather patterns. Shh, stop, don't rain anymore. He eliminated unfruitful trees just by speaking to them. And then he says this, how can we know he's the true one? One of the greatest intelligences, the greatest testimonies to his intelligence is this. He knew how to enter physical death, to actually die and then live on, to come back to life. He seized death by the throat and defeated it. Is Jesus smart? Yeah, the smartest person who's ever lived and he's God. He's the holy one, he's the true one. So right away, we should just say, we should just listen to him. We should listen to him just for what he could do. And it was easy for him to do that. So you think about your life. Think about the most difficult things you're facing right now. Can you trust him? Is he trustworthy? Yes, he's holy and he's true. But what else? He's got keys. And we already learned he has the keys to death and hell. He's been there. He punched death in the mouth. He took the keys. But it says he's got another key, a really important key, which we're going to dive into in a minute. But I just want you to think for a moment about keys and doors. My grandfather worked for the Southern Railway for like, I mean, 60 plus years. He was like, when he was 14 years old, he was carrying water to the other guys working on the train. And I remember, and I have this in my office, this thing he wore on his belt with whoop, the keys. And I didn't know what they were for. I knew they were for his job, but I was like, I love that thing. It is the coolest thing. And so when he passed away, I was, we were looking through all of his stuff and I asked grandma me, can I have Philly cheese? And this key thing, can I take this? Cause it was a, it was a memory of like, that's important. Jesus has keys. As a church, this is, and so you know how Jesus, they're going to relate to this stuff. They, the church in Philadelphia, had been kicked out, locked out of the synagogue. So ironically, Jesus is talking about keys and doors and about open doors. Our world is built on getting to and through the right doors, isn't it? You heard this phrase? Oh, you, if you know that person they will open some doors for you. You know, the key to this whole thing is if I just, who I know, what I study, how I study, how I spend my money, the way I do it, the timing and the place, if I could just get all of those things lined up, that would open doors for me. That would open doors for me. That would be the key to becoming whatever, successful. So we know this. We learn to do this. We learn to walk through the doors. Sometimes they're smaller. They're easier to get through. We get to different stages in our life. And we're like, that is a tough door to get through. But we figure it out. We talk to the right people. We learn the right stuff. We spend the time and we make it through. And we're like, I can't believe I made it through that door. If I could sit down with you right now, we could have coffee or tea or Philly cheese, whatever you prefer. And I could ask you, is there a door in your life right now, just in life that you're going, man, if I could just, Get this one open. Do you have any of those doors? I got them. I got things I'm thinking about right now. I'm like, I gotta get this door open. It drives me nuts. So Jesus taps into that idea because we also know this. There's this one door. There's this one door that we all know we should be going through. We cannot figure out how to do it. How to get in. And so we ignore it. We say, I don't care about that door. I don't care about that door. I don't care about, I'm, ah, because we do. 
We really do. <laughs> and the world that we live in, everybody tries to ignore this door and do every other door and every other key and be like, it's fine, it's fine. Ah. Sometimes we come back and we try again. That door is closed to us. We do not have the keys. And guess what? It's the only key and door that matter. It's the only key and door that matters. Why? Because this door enters the kingdom of God. And yes, you can try all these other doors and try to ignore that one. And people do it and we do it. But there's something in you. The Old Testament says he has placed eternity in your heart and you try and you will take a hundred other doors and even get through them and say, this is awesome. I can do whatever I want in this world. But then you'll find yourself at night. And this is usually the time. I don't know if you have this. When you, when you go to bed and when you lay your head on the bill and you, you think about the day and the stuff maybe that you are into, the stuff you're struggling with, and it's just you and right before sleep, I think it's one of the most powerful moments in a person's day. Because it's when you're like, uh, that door, that door. Why can't I get through that door? Why is it so hard? And Jesus steps up and he says, hey, guess what I got? <laughs> On his belt, I have the key. I've got it. What's he saying about himself? Here's another thing from Dallas Willard. He said, God did not send his son into the world so that it would be multiple choice. He didn't send him to die to go, yeah, it'll be one way. Multiple choice though. He died. He sent him to die because he was the only way. And he even describes himself, this is the way you do with metaphor and imagery in scripture, as the door himself. He's the key, he's the door, and he opens the door, meaning you can't get in here without me. You are absolutely free to walk over here and try a hundred other doors and keep saying, this one doesn't matter to you. Do it. We've all done it. But you'll keep coming back and you'll realize, ah, he's the one. He is the open door. And he's referencing Isaiah 22 here. Revelation, more than any other book in the New Testament, is all over the Old Testament. If you haven't heard us say that, he's just grabbing from everywhere. So Isaiah 22, this guy named Eliakim, he was a type of Christ. He says, I'm going to give him the key to the house of David, which was an image of the kingdom of God. And Jesus comes in and says, I got that key. And that was about me. And I am the way into the kingdom. Not multiple choice, one choice. Just me. The second interpretation, and this is only because the imagery and the wording is used in the rest of the New Testament, because some of you may know Jesus and you're like, I've already gone through that door. Shut up. Not really, but I get it. Don't say it anymore. Like, duh. Like sometimes we have that. It's like, well, I, I've done this, so this doesn't apply to me. Doesn't apply to me. Doesn't apply to me. And Jesus says, well, wait a minute. I've also placed before you, and Paul described this, an open door for ministry. So there's two things. One, are you walking through that door to pursue other people in Christ for them to know him? Are you standing in the way of people who are trying to get in? I think of a verse that Paul says, let's not make it hard for people to enter the kingdom of God. And they're trying to go through and you're like, ah, 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 ah. I have a few things to say before you go through. Max Lucado, I totally grew up on Max Lucado. My heart was developed spiritually by reading his stuff when I was in high school. And he talks about this open door for ministry. So those who don't know Jesus go through the open door into salvation. Those who do know Jesus, another possible interpretation, open door for ministry. Are you doing ministry? Or are you, no, I'm in the house. I don't care now. Here's what Max Lucado says. No holy huddles. We can't huddle in here. Get out there. The doors are open that we're to walk through. He says, when those who are called to fish don't fish, they fight. 
Now, what's fishing in, in Christian terms? I have called you to be fishers of men, to bring people into the kingdom. When those who are called to fish don't fish, they fight. When energy intended to be used outside is used inside, the result is explosive. Instead of casting nets, we cast stones. Instead of extending helping hands, we point accusing fingers. Instead of being fishers of the lost, we become critics of the saved. Rather than helping the hurting, we hurt the helpers. The result, church scrooges. Bah, humbug spirituality. Beady eyes searching for warts on others while ignoring the warts on the nose below. Crooked fingers that bypass strengths and point out weaknesses. Split churches, poor testimonies, broken hearts, legalistic wars. And sadly, the poor go unfed, the confused go uncounseled, and the lost go unpreached. When those who are called to fish don't fish, they fight. We know about this, don't we? Yeah, we live in the land of 10,000 lakes and churches in the country of 100,000 churches. Why do we have so many? Why do we have so many? Not because we're all excited, because somebody said, I don't like you. I'm going over here. Jesus says, I have the keys to get in and I have opened that door for you to do ministry. Two ways to look at it. If we know him, it's time to walk through open doors he's given us. To pray for the Lord to open doors that we think are closed as we look at other people. And we're going to talk about those other people here in the next few verses. But I think this is so important. I know it has been for my heart. Because Jesus says, hey, I know you've got a tiny bit of strength left. You're just hanging on. Anybody relate to that phrase? I know you got just a little bit left. You're just hanging on. And he says, but you've kept my word and you've not denied my name. You've kept my word and you've not denied my name. Are we those who are keeping his word specifically to enter into his kingdom and also to minister in his name, to ask people if they know Christ to minister to those who are lost? And you may think this, you know, it's kind of hard. It's too hard to stand up for Jesus in our world right now. But Jesus is saying, I've opened this door for you. I've opened it. I've unlocked it. He's holding it open. Just walk through. Just walk through. And don't get in the way of somebody else who's trying to walk through. So let's talk about those people out there that we're supposed to be fishing for. They're in the next verse. Verse 9. Note this. I will make those from the synagogue of Satan. Wow, Jesus. That's pretty direct. Who claim to be Jews and are not but are lying, I will make them come and bow down at your feet. To which sometimes we're like this. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's what's going to happen. And they will know that I have loved you. I don't think that's his tone, but we like to read it that way. Because you've kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. So those from the synagogue of Satan, you kind of have to read it with a raspy voice. Those from the synagogue of Satan, right? You just kind of have, it's like, ah, which I have interpreted this wrongly, parentheses, I believe. You want to be growing. I'm 51. Hopefully when I'm 71, and 81, and whenever, however long, that I will still be saying I'm growing. And you know what? You could listen to me five years ago and be like, wow, that is one arrogant punk. And hopefully you listen now and go, huh, that's different. I've had people say that to me. That's a really hard compliment to receive. You know, you've really changed. You're like, thank you. But thank you, Lord, that I am changing and learning to grow and unlearn some things that maybe I learned just because of tradition. And so I would read the synagogue of Satan and that these people are going to have to come and bow down to you. And, and what I think is, that's right. Those people, Jesus, those liars, those imposters, we are the people of God. You just wait and see 
and just fill in the blank. Anybody you don't like right now out there? Another political party, something like that? Somebody in some other state, some other label you'd like to throw around? Just fill it in. You people. He is going to get you. You're going to come crawling in and you're going to be bowing down and saying, you were right, we were wrong. That's right, we were right. That's how I've read it. Now, maybe not as blatant. Maybe I would have cleaned it up a little bit. It's a weird thing that happens to us. We come to know Jesus. We're overwhelmed that God would love us. It's amazing. He can forgive us, welcome us in. It's beautiful, it's undeserved, it's grace. We'll take it. But there's this dark side lurking that wants to raise the bar for anybody else to come in. It was here for me. <laughs> it was grace level for me. But you know what? For you, I'm going to demand this. And all of a sudden, the place where I used to be outside, I'm inside and I'm looking at those outside and I'm not looking with the eyes of grace or love. I'm looking with synagogue of Satan. You better bow down. You're going to bow down. You will confess that Jesus is Lord. You ever been there? You ever thought that about people? Do you think that about people? Jesus, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to hate the ones you love. I changed the hymn, I'm sorry. <laughs> prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to hate the ones you love. Don't give in to this temptation. He loves them. He loves them, we should too. The holy huddle can bring hatred for those outside. But if we're walking through those doors and we learn to read and we actually connect back, Old Testament helps us so much when we look at New Testament verses. So when Jesus brings up, they will bow down to you. You know, he's actually quoting Isaiah 45. And this is what it says. This is what the Lord says. The products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabaeans, men of stature, people outside Israel, they're going to come over to you and they will be yours. They will follow you. They will come over in chains and bow down and they will confess. God is with you. There is no other. There's no other God. Not in humiliation. Why are they coming? For salvation. Repentance. They're going to bow down, Jesus is actually saying, to the people that have kicked them out. The Jews in Philadelphia have said, you're not the people of God. We are. You're out. Door locked. Boom. Jesus says, actually, I have the keys. I'm opening this door. You guys can come on in. And by the way, the people that hate you, that you think hate you, and you think are the enemy, and you think are just the synagogue of Satan, and they're going to burn. By the way, they're going to come and bow down in repentance to me. You're going to see them Saved. Saved. It's a turning in repentance. Man, I need that truth, folks. I need it. If there's one thing God has been doing in me over the last four and a half years, this is it. This is it. It's learning to love people that don't know him yet. That is, it. if there's been one place of correction and rebuke for my heart from Jesus, it's, that is not how I feel about them, Chad. That is not what I've called you to do. Get out of the huddle. Get out of this place of pride and thinking you're better and go and do what I've asked you to do. Walk through the door. I'll do the work in their hearts, but you have to represent me. You have to represent me. He says, you've kept my command to endure. So therefore, I will keep you from the hour of testing. This one's a little, a, a, a little trip mine. This verse right here. Because he says, it's going to come on the whole world. Because you've kept my word, I will keep you from what? The hour of testing. Now, some... In the, and we've said this a few times. You're going to hear this from me a little bit more as we go through the book of Revelation. The popular interpretation of the book of Revelation for the last 200 years, 200 years, 
see this verse as God saying, I'm going to take the church up and out and away from a future tribulation. An hour of testing. Don't worry, I'll get you out. We are, in, not to say you cannot, I want you to hold it up against the 200 years of interpretation, but we're trying to a little bit focus on the first 1800 and to say what did the church believe up until the 1800s about verses like this. And here's what I would say, and this is not me, this is me learning. Everyone must go through this crucible. I will keep you from but not out of. Everybody must go through this crucible. A crucible purifies, melts precious metals, and it causes the junk to rise to the top, and it forms something new. Another way to interpret hour of testing is time of trial, meaning we, everybody, the way of the whole earth, every person on earth in every time, will endure physical suffering. Darn it, Barbie. I don't want that. But we will be kept spiritually safe. Which you're like, oh, thanks. Because <laughs> we don't have a box for it. We don't have a box for understanding that that's actually a better kind of safety. Every person will endure physical suffering, but we will be kept spiritually safe from it. We live in a very safe country with Pretty amazing set of government and rules. Yeah, sure, there's things that go wrong, but it's, it's pretty awesome that we can come in here and worship, isn't it? Yeah. But Jesus says, it's going to happen. You will endure suffering, but I'll keep you from it. Not out of it, from its ability to harm you. Spiritual protection, not physical protection. G.K. Beale, biblical scholar, says this, nowhere in Revelation does it promise that believers won't suffer physically. Nowhere. In fact, they should expect it. Ugh. That's the second thing I would say God has been doing in my life over the last four or five years is helping me understand suffering for his name's sake and how important it is. So what possible reason could Jesus have for letting this happen? To us, why? Why would you let us be hurt physically? So it depends on where we are spiritually. So a couple of different ideas. To those who reject Jesus consistently, no, no, no. I don't care about that door. I don't care about that door. Jesus says, okay, then I'm going to let some things happen in you. Not to punish you, but to move you. It's judgment but it's a judgment that potentially could lead to somebody turning around and saying, okay, have you, let me just ask this straight up. And this is a little bit out there. It's not for you to answer out loud. Please don't answer out loud. Um, <laughs> but think about it. Have you been pursuing a sinful lifestyle sometime in your life? You knew it was wrong. Hello, Siri. Siri. Siri came to church. Um, have you been in this verse in scripture to the one who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it? Say it. Anybody know? Sins. There's an easy definition of sin. To the one who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, sins. So have you ever in your life been defiant and dabbled in a sin and the Lord pursued your heart First, it was just a little messing with your conscience, but then there were consequences. There were physical consequences. Things happened and they increased and they kept increasing until eventually. We used to tell this to our kids when, when something would happen and we'd find out something that they'd been doing. And you could tell that it was that thing that we all do. I'm sorry, I got caught. <laughs> you know, that part of conviction. I'm sorry really sorry I got caught though, man. And I, we just say this because I think it's true. Jesus loves you too much to keep you from being caught. He will allow physical suffering, things to happen to get you to repent. 
Of course. Of course. What about for those who know him already? It's a testing that purifies and strengthens what you already have. But the physical suffering comes to everyone. John 17, Jesus said this, Father, I ask you not to take them out of the world, but keep them from, same words, same words, the evil one. Keep it from harming them spiritually, but keep them in it. <gasps> it's God's way. I'm bringing this test and it will lead you to repentance. It may be judgment at first, or it may just refine you and bring out what is already present to be even more beautiful. Next, he says, I'm coming soon. Guess what? For the Philadelphia church, if this was the return of Jesus, they didn't get it. So is he blowing smoke? Jesus, were you, you're talking to the church in Philadelphia? You're coming soon? You didn't come. What are you doing? Did you, you're the true one. Did you lie? Did you lie? So let's just put on our, a little bit of biblical thinking caps to say, so he's probably not talking about, and scholars would agree, the final return. Can Jesus come to you in another way? Yes. He can come to you spiritually in that time of trial. When you're in a time of testing, he will come. He will strengthen. He will help. He will hold you up. He will draw you close. That is how he comes. And that is, that's what I think happens here. Um, but I didn't make that up on my own. I stole it from others. And guess what? As far as that suffering, the church in Philadelphia, they kept suffering physically. It kept happening. So he wasn't keeping them from physical suffering. So he had to be doing something in their hearts, in their walk with Jesus to keep them safe. And then he says, so that you won't lose a crown. The crown is, it, it, the signif it signifies a victory crown, something that you get at the end of a race. The only way you can lose that crown is to reject Jesus. That's it. It's not something you do. You're not the one. The conquering is by belonging to him and being a part of his work already. It's a victor's crown. So he says, hold on to what you have because he's given it to them in the first place. But you're going to go through suffering. No, that's hard to hear. Last two verses. Verse 12. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. He will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from, God, from my God and my new name. I'm like, Lord, my legs are small. That's a lot of writing. Three different things it says he's going to write there. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So this is first time we hear something about the temple. You're going to hear it. It's a bigger theme in the book of Revelation. But it's also there's a little bit of a clue here on how to read things like this, how to view images, metaphors, symbolic things. When are they real? When are they not? Um, there's this guy that his name's Terry. Uh, I met him, gosh, 15, 8 maybe 15 years ago, um, and gifted in prophecy, small p, not big p. Like we don't have big p prophets, but we have small p prophecy in the New Testament where people hear certain things. And I'll just say this about me. While I've had some wackadoodle experiences with prophecy, I've also had some that are like treasured, things that have come true. And I'll be like, what? And things that have to do with me being actually in this city. The Lord spoke years ago when I wasn't even here that I look and I'll be like, wow, how did you know that? Stuff that I receive, there are people who are praying for me. I get messages from people. So you hold those things up against scripture. It's important. But I remember this guy, Terry, uh, really gifted in prophecy. And he was speaking and he was talking. And, you know, when you hear people like this who say they've seen visions of the new heavens and the new earth, you're like, wow, that's awesome. And I remember he started talking about, he said, I was, I saw the new Jerusalem. He said, I saw the new heavens and the new earth. And he says, and I saw the walls. And he said, and there were, like Peter said, living stones, people in the walls. 
And if he had seen my face, it was like this. Like I'm listening to him and I just kind of like, I raised my hand and I was like, is that a good thing? Like, I don't know if I want to be <laughs> stuck in a wall. But that's how I was seeing. I was like, if, if it's, which, how do I know if it's real or not? You are living stones. I'm like, stones don't really move. <laughs> They're just stuck there. Is that what we are? So it, it, auto, it brought up this thing because you have things in Revelation. You're going to have them in Scripture where there'll be parts of them where you'll be like, oh yeah, that's for sure metaphor. And other parts you're like, well, no, 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 that's real. Which, how do we know? How do we look at it? So it's, like I said, it's the first mention of the temple in Revelation. It's going to be a huge theme throughout the book, especially as we get to measurements and materials and critical events associated with it and sacrifices that are happening that shouldn't be happening in the eventual return of Jesus. The topic is huge. The topic has spiritual toes that people don't want you to step on, but Jesus likes to step on spiritual toes, I've found. So what do we do with it? I heard a news story this week. Uh, I have looked at several things. I mentioned this actually on the podcast um, Christian news station talking about how there are red heifers. If, if you track it all with Revelation and the temple and all this kind of stuff, you'd be like, oh yeah, yeah. If you don't know, I'll bring you up to speed. There are red heifers, red cows that are unblemished, being raised right now. They're two years old. They have to be three years old in order to be sacrificed. There's a guy, he has purchased land on the Mount of Olives for the rebuilding of the temple. There's something called the Temple Institute. They have priests who were not born in the hospital, so they're not defiled by dead people. So they're actually qualified to be priests. And part of that 200-year interpretation includes there's going to be a real temple and real priests. And that's why there's red heifers. And we should support it because it's going to bring the return of Jesus. And I was listening to it going, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this. And I'm not saying one way or the other, because I want to say this. What is the temple? Let's just look at what scripture says. Is it a, if you're going to be a pillar in the temple, okay, well, obviously we all know it's like, no, like we're not going to be like permanent architectural fixtures in a future building of God. That'd be super boring, right? Hello. Good to see you. So glad I'm a pillar. This is awesome. No, we know it's the, obviously we can already think, okay, he's, he's talking metaphor here, isn't he? A little figurative, but let's just ask, what is the temple? Because those who are like, it's a real temple. There are red heifers and there are priests and there's land and it's going to all come together. And then Jesus is going to come back. How do we know? So is it a real dwelling that you could put your hands on? You could touch the stones. You could stand on its floor. You could look at its wall and decor and be in awe at the temple of God. That's one. Two, or is it Jesus? What did he say? John chapter two, destroy this temple. I will rebuild it in three days. What? This thing took years to build and you're going to rebuild it in three days. And John gives you a little parenthetical and he says, they didn't know he was talking about his body. That's two. Number three, or is it us? In Corinthians and in Peter, we are told you're the temple. You are living stones, part of the house of God. Here's my answer. Yes. <laughs> How's that for dodging? I'm not though, because I'm going to say yes for now, because it's all we get. We get all of it. We know that there is going to be a physical reign and representation of God and Jesus and the kingdom on the earth. It's going to be something you can touch, something you can see. But we also know that he's talking about himself and he's talking about us. And some things are need to know basis and we don't know all of it. And God's like, you're just going to have to deal with it. That's what I've got. So let's just think about the imagery for a minute. We're going to kind of finish with a few thoughts here. We're not going to be fixed pieces of architecture in a building, in a physical building. We're not going to have real writing on our resurrection skin, are we? No. But what do we know when we talk figuratively, figuratively about things like this? Like if I were to say, Nora... 
Sorry, I'm going to call you out. Nora is a rock. She's a rock. She loves Jesus. This is just foundational follower of Jesus. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you get it. When I say she's a rock, or even, we even say this one, like, man, they're pillars. They are pillars in the church. What am I saying? They've been here a long time. They are faithful. They love the Lord. So we get that already. How about the whole thing of having your name? Like, have you ever had somebody say, oh, Chad, that Philly cheese, that has your name written all over it. What do I know? What are they saying? It's all you, man. That's you. So what is Jesus saying? You are going to be a part of his kingdom, his house permanently, permanently, integral. What's he saying when he says he's going to write his name on you in the name of the city, in the name of my God? He's saying, you will belong to me. You'll be mine forever. And this isn't new stuff. A lot of people will accuse and say, you're just spiritualizing Old Testament language that really needs to come true in order for the Messiah to come back. And that's not fair. It isn't. The Old Testament is filled with this imagery. Zechariah 4, 6. You may know this verse from a song or from using it. It's a good bumper sticker. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What? To build the temple. That's the context. How do we know that? We'll look at Zechariah 6. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold the man whose name is the branch. Who's the branch? Anybody know? Jesus. He shall branch out from his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Interesting. It is he who shall build it. Matthew 21, Jesus said to them, if you never read in the scriptures, Isaiah, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it was marvelous in our eyes. And then Peter and John picked up on it again in Acts 4 and said, this Jesus is the stone. He's the cornerstone of the building rejected by you, the builders, has become the cornerstone. There is salvation found in no one else, no other name under heaven. Guys, if they're doing it, we got to do it. We got it. Doesn't mean there's not going to be a physical place eventually for us to dwell, but we should think about these verses and then we're going to cheat to Revelation 21. Real quick, just real quick. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Because when they're talking temple, they're talking new heaven and new earth. They're talking new creation. He says, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. That one really bothers my mom because she likes the ocean. But what they're saying is the sea stands for chaos and disorder. In the beginning, the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters and the waters that they had to pass through in Exodus. It's metaphorical. The sea is not there, meaning the chaos is not there anymore. And I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. That's what he just said to the church in Philadelphia. The temple coming down, prepared like a bride, adorned for her husband. And a lot of us are like, yeah, we, there's measurements. We can measure it out. And I've got all the measurements down. We're missing it if we go there. I heard a loud voice from the throne. God's dwelling is with humanity. And then a curious verse, 22. I did not see a temple in this city. No temple, because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And we're going to do more of this stuff, and you may be like, Poof, you lost me at Philly Cheese. I don't know what you're talking about. That's okay. That's okay. You're not supposed to get it all. And remember, 80%. We don't know which 80%. So you jump in, and where is the Lord speaking to you? But what I hear, and how what we're going to feel is the temple of which you are to be a part, if you want, is so much more than a physical building. We're talking about the presence of God. We're talking about the new Jerusalem. We're talking about God, his new city, his dwelling place, new creation, what comes down from heaven to earth. The two merge and become our future home. Wait a minute. Your future home is here? I don't know if you thought about that. We think of heaven as being, get me out of this garbage hole. I don't care about this earth. Whatever. It's going to, you ever heard this one? It's going to burn. It's going to burn. 
it's another place where you need to think about the words and what scripture means when it uses words like burning and fire, it's purify, it's recreation, it's crucible, it's making something new. Yes, your future home is here. If you die today, you will be with Jesus, but it is a temporary place. It's an in-between place with him. It's beautiful, it's glorious, it's heavenly. It's still separated though, because what is going to happen? Let's imagine heaven here. Let's imagine earth here. What is heaven coming down? And I see the temple coming and the two become Edenic. If you haven't heard that word before, it means Eden-like. What's he doing? What's God doing this whole thing? He goes, we're going to make all of this new. And it will be physical. Yes. Jesus has a resurrection body with the marks that you can touch and see. He ate food in front of them. I think it was intentional. He wasn't just this floaty spirit that was resurrected. He ate food. He's like, you got any fish? It's going to be physical to the one who conquers. Not who lives a great, perfect religious life. How do we conquer? We accept the conqueror's work. I'll give you a place, a permanent place, your name, my name written on you. So in my heart, I say, I'll take it. I'll take it. How about you? Let's pray. Lord, I, uh, it's encouraging to, at the very least, Lord, to know today, if we know you, that these things are true. God, I mentioned those first two things of how you've been correcting and just helping me to unlearn some things that have been, I think, unhealthy in the way I've seen other people, the way I've pursued ministry. But I would say this, this idea of you actually renewing and restoring this place and ruling and reigning in a real physical way, Lord, is so compelling. <laughs> It's so compelling. And Lord, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. God, we, I think all of us could easily identify this morning and say, yeah, I got a little bit of strength left. Just a little bit. And Lord, I pray that in uh, the way you can for each person here, maybe tonight, Lord, when they are about to go to sleep and they are going back through the whole day and thinking about uh, the door of your kingdom or thinking about how they process suffering in the crucible or how they long for a future home. God, would you come to them? God, could we hear this morning, I'm coming soon. And Lord, while we are super excited about your final return, Lord, could we experience your coming this week in our walk with you, Lord, in a moment, a holy moment of maybe being in very difficult circumstances, but hearing you say, hey, you're mine. I've got you. You are in my house. My name is written on you. I will hold you through this. Lord, for others this morning, maybe they are trying still to ignore that one door. Lord, I pray they would see the love on your face, your invitation. God, the door is propped open. We can go through your body and blood. And Lord, as we just sing, one more song together. We ask that your spirit would move throughout this room. Pray, God, we would sense your hands on our shoulders, your voice in our spirit, and we would respond. Amen. If you feel led, let's stand and sing.